They are facing the highest inflation of a lifetime because of failed Kamala economics. They are facing a raging border crisis that has devastated American communities because of Kamala Harris's role as Joe Biden's open borders are. And they are seeing a weak foreign policy that has plunged the world into a state of chaos. We cannot afford four more years of failure and weakness under Kamala Harris. On the floor this week, House Republicans will bring a series of bills to combat the Biden-Harris failed foreign policy of appeasement that has emboldened our adversaries like Communist China. I also want to briefly touch on this afternoon's Oversight Committee hearing, where I will join members of the Select Committee on COVID to demand long overdue answers from disgraced former Governor Andrew Cuomo on behalf of the families who lost loved ones as a result of his fatal nursing home directive. Yesterday, the Select Committee released a report detailing that disgraced Governor Cuomo himself and his most senior aides ordered, directed, and executed the deadly nursing home executive order, killing over 15,000 vulnerable seniors, confirming what hardworking New Yorkers have known for years. This bombshell testimony also reveals that the disgraced former governor and his top aides were caught covering up their culpability and guilt in an attempt to selfishly save their shredded reputations. There is no question that Andrew Cuomo is responsible for the deaths of innocent nursing home seniors. I want to turn it over to Chairman John Molinar, who's going to talk about many of the bills we have on the floor this week, and then we're going to hear from our Foreign Affairs Chair, Mike McCall, and the rest of leadership. I'm going to start with John Molinar. Thank you, uh, Conference Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Speaker Johnson and the Republican leadership for bringing over two dozen bills on U.S.-China competition while tackling CCP aggression head-on from the American heartland to the Taiwan Strait. The Speaker has been supportive of the committee's work, and I'm thankful for his vote of confidence in pledging to continue the committee in the next Congress. I'm proud that many of the Select Committee's recommendations are included in the bills this week, along with important legislation from the House Foreign Affairs Committee led by Chairman McCall, as well as some of the other standing committees. And we're here today because the Chinese Communist Party presents the greatest threat to American values and American national security in our lifetime. But we can stand up to the CCP by defending our values and reducing the party's leverage over the United States. This week, Congress will take action to secure our supply chains, from electric vehicle batteries to health care to critical infrastructure. The Chinese Communist Party wants to make us dependent on companies subject to its direction. Legislation on the floor this week will take steps to protect taxpayers from being used by the CCP to advance its leverage <coughs> over our critical <coughs> supply chains. China Week will also protect American technology. We need to stem the flow of sensitive American technology to our foremost adversary by strengthening our export controls. Legislation brought up by several of my colleagues, including Mr. Barr, a member of the Select Committee on China, will take meaningful steps to advance accountability and close loopholes permitting the flow of sensitive technology to the PRC. And most importantly, China Week will defend our values. Legislation on the floor this week will defend human rights in Hong Kong and counter the CCP's malign influence around the world. This week, we will draw a line in the sand. With one voice, the U.S. Congress will tell Xi Jinping this far and no further. I again want to applaud the Speaker Johnson and the House leadership for bringing these bills to the floor and making China Week a reality. I'll turn it over now to Chairman McCall. Thank you, John. I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson as well, uh, particularly for inviting the Gold Star families uh, today to for a presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal on behalf of their children who were blasted by a suicide bomber that came out of Bagram Prison, and it didn't have to happen. But I want to thank you, sir, for honoring their sacrifice, and those families who I was with last night. Um, we've been working, I'd say three years, but really two. The first year, the Democrats were in power, and we did absolutely nothing to investigate the events of Afghanistan and what happened that day through the evacuation. After 
this is probably the most comprehensive investigation with the witnesses, the documents. It's an historic document. It's not a political document. It's very historic. I was a federal prosecutor. My uh, lead investigator, AUSA and Afghan, we wrote this. And if, before you criticize it, read it. Everything is built on facts and evidence. And we made our case. We didn't draw conclusions in advance. We built the case all the way up. What we found was actually quite um, disturbing. <clears throat> we found that on day one, Joe Biden didn't care about the Doha agreement. I know a lot has been said about Doha and that you know, President Trump entered into Doha, but that, can, that agreement had conditions placed in it. First of all, Taliban cannot attack U.S. forces, which they were doing. They cannot harbor or protect al-Qaeda, which they were doing. Al-Zawahiri being the prime example, number two to bin Laden was protected by the Haqqani Taliban. Uh, in Afghanistan. So when Secretary Pompeo briefed President Trump on that, he said they're, they're in violation. We're going to keep our 2,500 troops, 6,500 NATO, with the blessing of NATO, our air cover, most importantly, and our contractors. And we are not going to abandon the Afghans. On day one, President Biden comes into office with a political agenda, a campaign promise built on a timeline. The timeline is to withdraw by the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Had nothing to do with policy, had nothing to do with national security, rather everything to do with a political timeline gimmick. And for those who say that Doha is somehow factored into the president's thinking, I would just refer you to his, his spokesperson, who said Doha is immaterial to this evacuation. They were hell-bent to get out. It was called go to zero, and they did. Go to zero meant all military, it meant all contractors, it meant all air cover and intelligence pulling out of Afghanistan, leaving the Afghan army defenseless. So what happens? State Department is charged with the evacuation plan. But they didn't have a plan. They didn't have a plan until the day, they didn't initiate the plan until the day the Taliban actually took over Kabul. Think about that. On their way to the embassy. Ambassador Wilson in charge of this flees as a coward, runs to the airport, leaves his employees at the embassy, including the 100 Afghans who we promised we would protect were left to the Taliban, thousands of classified documents and passports burned, seven billion in Bagram prison left behind, most importantly, thousands of ISIS-K prisoners, the worst of the worst, released out of Bagram, which now impacts this country. They put the Taliban in charge, can you imagine this? You've been fighting the Taliban for 20 years, and now your sworn enemy is your brother in arms. The Taliban is checking the checkpoints. All of the American citizens, the Afghan partners, and the women and children have to go through the Taliban first to decide if they can get through. Now, if you're an Afghan partner who fought against them, what are the odds the Taliban's gonna let you through? We do know one thing, the Taliban let the suicide bomber from Bagram through the checkpoint to then kill 13 servicemen and women who we'll be honoring later today. But it didn't have to happen. But because there's no plan, there's chaos at the airport. The Taliban's there firing. Our Marines are thrown on the ground undefended. And that fate, that time, that day, we knew the day and the time it was going to happen. And sure enough, boom, and 13 servicemen and women killed, 170 Afghans killed, 45 Afghan military personnel and American wounded, a massive suicide blast uh, that didn't 
have to happen. So what are, what are the ramifications of all this? First of all, we need to fix this. So that if we ever have an evacuation like this again, uh, this will never happen again. We had Saigon, we have this, but we have to get legislatively, and by the way, Mike Pompeo did open a crisis office that was tailored to this, that Biden shut down on day one, puts on hold, two weeks before the Taliban overrun Kabul, he shuts down the very office that was designed to help protect. Well, we're going to bring that back in, in legislation. So where are we today? Well, when you project weakness, like Afghanistan, you invite aggression and conflict and war. It only took a month or two before the Russian Federation's moving into Ukraine. Chairman Xi and Putin are becoming allies, the Unholy Alliance. Xi, Xi is threatening Viet, uh, uh, Taiwan and the South Pacific, and they're tied to the Ayatollah in the Middle East. Ayatollah raising his ugly head with Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthi rebels, threatening the Jewish people in Israel. It's not separated. It is all tied together. The three unholy alliance warriors, and I throw Kim Jong-un in there as well. So that is a state of play this president has put us in, in a, a moment of weakness across the globe, not strength. And then to end this whole scenario, this whole nightmare, when you take a failed foreign policy and connect it to a broken border policy, what do you get? When you've released thousands of ISIS-K from Bagram, who have gone up to the Khorasan region, Tajikistan, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, most dangerous part in their external operations, Khorasan equals external operations. Those are the ones coming through visa-free Nicaragua, through Mexico, into the United States. Don't take my word for it. The FBI briefed me. They've detained eight of them. They got in, by the way, through the CBP-1 app set up an interview and were released into, into our society later to be caught by the FBI and a smuggling ring of 400. And God knows how many more are in this country, a ticking time bomb, a threat to the American people. So with that, I want to turn it over to our wit, Tom Emmer. Yesterday, Hakeem Jeffries sent his Democrat colleagues a letter urging them to reject our government funding plan, which includes the SAVE Act, claiming that House Democrats, quote, have consistently put people over politics. Today, I would like to correct the record. The House Democrats have consistently put illegal immigrants over law-abiding American citizens. In July, House Republicans passed the SAVE Act a common-sense bill that requires proof of citizenship for voter registration and removes non-citizens from voter rolls. Uh, that should already be happening. Meanwhile, 198 House Democrats voted in favor of illegal immigrants over ensuring safe and secure elections all over this country. The Harris-Biden administration even issued a veto threat, claiming this legislation is unnecessary. If that's true, why are they so afraid of making the SAVE Act law? You can't have it both ways. Why are they calling a common sense bill like the SAVE Act a, quote, poison pill? The American people aren't fools. They can read between the lines. It's all part of the Democrat Party's grand design. Over the past three and a half years, border czar Kamala Harris let over 10 million illegal immigrants into our country. And now, Democrats would rather shut the government down than stop them from voting in federal elections. By the way, there is evidence out there that shows non-citizens have made their way onto voter rolls. Plus, we should keep in mind this is about the American people, and 87 percent of American citizens agree that proof of citizenship should be a requirement before registering to vote. House Democrats call preventing illegals from voting in our elections, quote, partisan and extreme. House Republicans and the American people call it common sense. And with that, I turn it over to Speaker Mike Johnson. 
Thank you, Whip, and thanks to these two great chairmen, uh, Molinar and McCall, who've done extraordinary work on the issues they talked about, and I wish we had time to unpack it all further. As you can tell, either of them could go all morning and give you all sorts of detail. But there's a lot of important things happening right now. Let me address a few, because we just have a couple of moments. It literally, in about seven minutes, we're supposed to be in the rotunda for the gold medal um, award ceremony, and I'm really grateful that we're doing that. It's been, uh, it's been too long. Uh, we'll be doing that in the rotunda. As you know, we'll be honoring the lives of 13 American service members who were killed by terrorists in combat. <clears throat> you heard some of the explanation of that. They lost their lives because of this administration's catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan. The facts are stark, and they are unavoidable. The administration has failed these families, and after all these years, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have not even had the courtesy to this day to say their names publicly. In just a few minutes, we're going to do that. We're going to say their names, we're going to honor them, we're going to give them the Congressional Gold Medal, and that is the highest honor that we can bestow in Congress. And the, the families of those 13 brave men and women certainly deserve that. It's also China Week, as you heard. Um, we're taking some very important measures, over a dozen, or two dozen bills, actually, to counter the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this is something that our committees have been working on for months, and this is something that we must do. China is uh, a, a great adversary to us right now, to be very frank. Uh, I was uh, recently with our G7 partners for the speakers' meeting, and all of our allied nations are deeply concerned about what China is doing, and they look to us for leadership. We are, we are the last superpower on the earth, and we need to act accordingly and take appropriate action, and that's what you're going to see. Because the White House has chosen not to confront China and stand for Americans' interests, House Republicans will. That's what you'll see. Tomorrow is 9-11, and we will be observing, as we do every year, a moment of silence campus-wide, 8.46 a.m. Uh, we're reminded on a week like this when we honor gold medal families and we, we remember September 11th uh, that freedom is precious, and the people who are willing to devote and even offer their lives in service to that should be duly honored. Let me address the CR and the SAVE Act. Um, we had a good meeting with conference just now, some very thoughtful discussion with all the House Republicans. And let me just explain very briefly and very simply why I think this is the appropriate thing for us to do. We have two primary responsibilities upon us right now. I mean the Congress, the House of Representatives, and that is to responsibly fund the government and to do everything within our constitutional authority to ensure that we have a free and fair election. Everyone in this country is concerned about that. How can I say that? Because I've been traveling the country nonstop. As of uh, the end of last week, I have done campaign and fundraising events, large events, in 198 cities across 39 states, coast to coast, from Washington State to Miami, from Maine to California, all points in between. It does not matter where I am or what public forum it is. Every single time, almost without exception, in all of those cities, every time, open it up for audience questions. The first or second question is about election security. The American people in blue states and red states, in big cities and rural America, they're worried about this. We have to do what we can. The SAVE Act is a response to what we deem to be one of the immediate threats, and that is illegals voting. How can we say that? They say it's not really a problem, Democrats say. It's already against federal law. It is against federal law, but so is minors buying alcohol. But we still require identification to do it. Why? Because just because something's on, on the books doesn't mean people are going to comply. You don't get to go into a liquor store or to go buy cigarettes and check a box and say, oh, yeah, I'm 21. Give me the product. That's not how it works. It's not logical. It is an exceedingly logical thing to require the states to request proof of citizenship before they sign somebody up to vote. This is happening across the country. Pennsylvania is a very important swing state. Thousands of illegals are on the uh, voter rolls there. Georgia, thousands of illegals on the, on the voter rolls. Ohio, Texas, uh, across the, the board, across the country, every time, Virginia, every time a state looks at this, they find that it is happening. We are in an era of razor-thin election margins, right? The polling right now in the presidential is the closest that it's ever been. I don't put much stake in that. I'm convinced Donald Trump's going to win the White House, and I can't wait for it to happen. But it will be decided by a, a narrow margin, if you believe the polls. We have members of Congress, as you know, Marionette Miller-Meeks won her first election in 2020 to Congress by six votes. We have members in California who have won their, uh, Garcia, Duarte, and others, won their districts by 200 votes, 300 votes. It matters. If you have a few thousand illegals participating in an election in the wrong place, you can change the makeup of Congress, and you can affect the presidential election. 
The American people understand this. It is an 87% issue. It's almost 90-10. doesn't matter what party people are in. They, they, they demand, they want us, and they deserve us to take this action and make sure that illegals cannot taint the election. Only U.S. citizens should vote in U.S. elections, and the Democrats apparently don't agree with that. When we put it on the floor in July, 198 House Democrats voted against it. Well, we're going to give them another opportunity. And I believe we can do both things. I believe we can fund the government responsibly, and I believe that we can do right by the American people and ensure the security of our elections. And I defy anybody to give me any logical argument why we shouldn't do that. That's why I'm so resolute about this. That's why this is a fight worth having. It's a fight the American people demand for us, and that's why we're moving forward with the legislation. I've got a few more colleagues to talk about. We'll be doing that today. Uh, the rule vote will come up, and then uh, the, the plan is for the vote uh, on Wednesday as scheduled. Um, and we'll see what happens. I got time for like two questions, and we got to go to the gold medal ceremony. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that the opposition in your life, Brian, things like that, Margie, Tony, they're concerned that if you're just going to drop the same act once the Senate, the White House, will reject this plan. So can you say right now that you are ruling out passing a clean CR? Manu, I am in this to win this. I believe, as I just told you, this is a conviction I feel deep in my heart. I've been a co-sponsor of the SAVE Act from the beginning, and I think it's something we must do. That's why it's worth fighting for. I'm not going to engage in conjecture and, and uh, you know, try to game out all the outcomes. I think this is something that we should do, and that's what we're doing. I told the conference that this morning. I'll say it here again. I am resolved on this, I, and I don't know what more I can say to show that conviction. Well, we're, I'm very concerned about that, and so are our allies in Europe. I just met with them within the last several days. Uh, our allies in that region are concerned because we all know that China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are coordinating together. They're using one another's weapons systems. They're, they're financing each, each other's operations because, as was noted earlier, they've seen weakness projected from the Biden-Harris White House. We, when we project weakness on the world stage, freedom is imperiled all around the globe. We know that. We understand the burden that we carry and have since World War II. That's why we have to have strength back from the White House. We maintain peace through strength. That was the Reagan principle that we still believe in. I'll defer to you. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. With, uh, the speaker Go ahead. Shepard, we, uh, I put in there sanctions against drones and missiles from Iran to Russia. This is my point. We also put sanctions on energy exports to the tune of $80 billion that fund terror operations. I would call upon the administration to enforce the sanctions that Congress passed in the supplemental that I passed. Well said. I would love to do this all day, but we have got to get the rotunda because the families are waiting and about 400 guests. So um, thank you. I'll see you all in the hallway. Sorry. Appreciate it.